Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for, for coming um, to this conversation. I got some kind of state of the art of some tech of from our models uh, and then some uh, preposterous hypothesis on top on uh, the, the problems at hand. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of cool um, results all over social media um, that has created all the buzz. Um, and, and really, I think it's worth pausing for a second and, and considering what is actually happening here, um, how intelligent are those models really, and um, what can we expect from them, and what can we expect from them going forward? Because we not only wanna, wanna think about what we can do with today's technology, but also what we now need to start doing in order to prepare for tomorrow's technology. Um, and I think an important um, first step there is uh, kind of the, the sentence in the middle, we can only learn from signals. And um, so this is like an arbitrary uh, categorization of uh, uh, increasingly more intelligent or complex things. At the very top, we got patterns, structure, objects. This is kind of what AI has been doing for years and years and years. Uh, we can all recognize patterns. Um, and then we got things like a world model um, that is allowing us to memorize things or see things that are not clearly obvious and are not clearly in our perception or in our sensors. And then we got something that's maybe even underlying, like a causal structure, interdependencies, uh, probabilities. Um, and if we were playing Minecraft, that would be what we immediately see, what we know to be around the corner, and the rules we know these worlds follow. So this is like a, a part of the generative uh, structure that's behind every wor Minecraft world. And the interesting thing is that um, the world model oftentimes can kind of be observed, not at one time in, in, in space, but kind of by walking around and, and uh, looking at a lot of things. But the causal structure or the, the rules that are following everything cannot be directly observed. Um, and so w thinking about signals and, and uh, what, what are some signals, what, how can we get signals for all these kind of things? And um, so we need signals for patterns, we need signals for hidden word state, we need signals maybe for self and consciousness, and we need signals for causality. And uh, it's important to think about these signals because um, I would, I would um, dare to, to say that a, a big reason for the absence of the kind of lower level stuff in uh, today's AI is not necessarily that they fundamentally can't do these things, but that the signals we have been feeding these models with don't really contain these kind of uh, signals. So if you have basically a model that is fed an uninterrupted uh, stream of texts and images that don't really have anything to do with one another without the ability to act, without any persistence, without any embodiment, then it's maybe difficult to develop um, a sense for causality or a sense for consciousness. Um, so, and that's what we are seeing with today's um, uh, results. So this is, uh, you, you probably have seen tons of, of, of these kind of things and they all seem pretty all right. They seem to have learned a lot about superficial structure, but they're not internally consistent. There is no clear underlying world model, there's no kind of reason. And of course, right, why should there? Um, we don't really want them to be. And you can see this with um, some of these results that are, at first glance, seem very uh, familiar. So I, I, what I like about these two examples is that if you kind of skim by and you just brief, briefly look at them, you say, okay, I've, I've seen this kind of content before. I know what this is about. But when you look closer, you realize that there's something really wrong with that. Um, and this is because it's only like a superficial approximation. And this is because I would argue that the signal doesn't really call for anything else. Um, and of course, this includes uh, famous uh, examples of astronauts and horses. So everything that is uh, out of distribution are difficult to get right. And everything that is not well represented by the training data and or loss function is also difficult to get right. Um, and we see the same with text. 
So here is a conversation I had um, where I say, I have three kumquats, I give one of them to you, and you give one to Gonzo. How many kumquats do I have left? Which is like a relatively straightforward question, but um, it's not so straightforward for these for these systems, so they can get it right, they can get it right as on the right hand side, or they can get it wrong as twice on the left hand side. And because the reason why they get these kind of very simple things wrong is that um, they're not well represented in the training data and or loss function. So the learned distribution kind of struggles with these things. Um, and uh, I like this uh, example, um, especially, um, well, the, this is like the famous uh, uh, challenge of an eight liter and a three liter jug. How can I measure five liters? And this is ChatGPT answering um, and telling, fill the eight liter jug, pour, pour the contents into the three liter jug. Now the eight liter jug has five liters liquid remaining in it. That's correct so far. Empty the three liter jug completely, okay. Pour the five liters of liquid from the three liter jug back into the three liter jug. And <laughs> the three liter jug now contains five liters of liquid. <laughs> okay, so it kind of lost uh, the thread somewhere along the line. Um, but it, the, the structure is kind of right. So it has, has kind of understood how these, how these challenges look like and how you would, in principle, answer these kind of challenges but the underlying reasoning process does not seem to be switched on. And I think this is interesting, and this is something we have to keep in mind whenever we, we use this technology, that uh, it has a very superficial, but nevertheless powerful understanding of our world. Um, and this is what you can see basically here, um, the impact of scale. Uh, this is our multimodal model ask um, if this cat were elected, its first order of business would be two. And if you ask our smallest model, it'll tell you make sure the economy is strong. And uh, which I think is a fine answer for a president, right? Make, it's always the economy stupid. Um, but if you ask our bigger model, it says declare war on the dog. So uh, the first one is trained on 64 GPUs, and the second one is on 256 GPUs. Um, and so maybe with, with added scale, we, we have added capability to maybe understand humorous content and, and understand background knowledge about cats and all these kind of things. So with scale, we got added resolution. We, we get added, added resolution in the tails. Um, and so these seem like the output. Uh, come of reasoning. We might think that there, uh, there is a reasoning process that has caused this. This is not necessarily the case. Um, and uh, what I've been thinking about um, as I see ChatGPT improving is, can we basically drag all major reasoning tasks from like a lower level of understanding up to the stochastic parrot. As a, can we basically, without giving the model fundamental understanding, a foundational understanding, can we nevertheless make it so good at all these kind of tasks by just increasing pattern recognition so that it really makes no difference? And then we maybe end up with a Chinese room, um, which is in a way that, that idea. Um, and this seems to kind of work, and this seems to kind of work, and this has never really worked in the past with AI, and it now seems to kind of work um, because we have powerful neighborhood relationships, and those neighborhood relationships, uh, the proximities in these neighborhood relationships, so at least my understanding, uh, make this uh, in a way possible. And um, this is uh, from, from our work um, where we, where we uh, introduced a multimodal image generation. And the uh, special thing about it, and here we compare it with stable diffusion, and the, the special thing about this is that um, our uh, model is basically a language model that has learned to also understand images. And so what we, uh, what we see here is not, so the, the takeaway here is not that our model is a better model. The takeaway here is that the structure that is in language um, is a better suited for reasoning and uh, conceptual relationships. So things like a green apple and a red car, a blue book and a red cup, something like that, um, is, that's what language is built for. Language is perfect at representing and, and being precise about these kinds of relationships and uh, image encodings, especially when they're trained on, on captions, are not really, don't really contain the signal that well. 
Um, exactly, that's what I said. Um, so basically, some, some more examples. Um, you can prompt our model with a combination of text and images. So everything you see on the left-hand side is a prompt. And then on the right-hand side, basically, you see the results there. And um, this basically shows that the multimodal prompt is pretty good at combining uh, conceptual information from language and images in, co in combination. And of course, um, because it is built on top of a five-language model, it works really well in these five languages. Um, and it, you can even do things like uh, arithmetic with images, which is uh, the thing on the, on the very low, uh, lower side where we can add the Eiffel Tower to uh, a car or where we can subtract the light bulb from an image where a tree is inside a light bulb. Well, it's like a little bit conceptual arithmetic. Um, and what we recently introduced, I think this is really powerful if we want to understand what these superficial structures are that we, these models have learned. Um, and so now we can trace every output token back to its, to its origin, back to the information inside the prompt that has caused its creation. And one example here is the short story, The Terrible Old Man, where the uh, conclusion of the model is that the old man is exceedingly feeble, both physically and mentally. And if we now click on mentally and, and ask ourselves, okay, what is, the, what is the most impactful observation that has caused this, uh, this word? It's a sentence that describes how the old man talks to his bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom. And whenever he speaks to a bottle, a little lead pendulum within makes a certain definite vibration as if in answer. So that's a learned pattern, right? And this is already increasingly more powerful than keywords and, and or like relative uh, uh, um, frequencies, so things we used in the past. And this allows also the human to um, validate quickly or like more more easily uh, the outcomes of these models because of course they still are gonna be wrong um, and the other interesting aspect here is that we can kind of do use the same method in reverse we can also look at things that contradict a certain outcome um, here's the quarterly war one earnings reports from HBE uh, where Antonio Neri is speaking and um, if I now look at the statement where there will be no acquisitions we get a strong negative um, impact on the sentence. We will continue to access organic and inorganic investments that improve our competitive position. So now we can basically know, can we, can we look at what has caused this uh, completion, but also what is, what is most antithetical to, to this completion, and so provide full, full context uh, given that. And of course, this works in multimodality. Um, a beautiful sunset over a city, and a sunset is proven by this part of the image, um, and city is proven by this part of the image, proven in kind of quotation marks. Uh, and of course, it works the other way around, right? So you've already seen the, the castle got a negative peak on city because it's not a city, it's a castle. And here you basically see the same thing. Uh, house number is 30, gives a positive link, and house number is 50, gives a negative link um, on, the, uh, on the image. Um, so that's pretty powerful. Um, but this is not sufficient for um, explainability in a new era. And um, why, um, uh, the, like, uh, I want to use this example to show you why. Um, Christmas morning in the 80s, right? So if your job would be now to evaluate the correctness of this caption, how would you, how would you do that? That's not super obvious. Um, what you could do is you could um, get a completion that describes the contents of this image, compute a new computer from Santa, and then trace computer and Santa, and then you would get a uh, impact on computer for the box and Santa for the Christmas tree, and then you could ask yourself or the model, what kind of computer do we have here? Um, Commodore 64, okay. And uh, during what time was the Commodore 64 on the market? 82 to 94. So we can say that it's very plausible that Christmas morning in the 80s is a caption, a correct caption for this image. But in order to understand that, we need much more than just one heat map. We need basically a multi-step process that adds world knowledge and context understanding. So uh, I think this is, this is a level of explainability that we, we only just begin to, to um, work with. 
Um, and we recently published a paper on that as well, where we trained um, the multimodal model to explain um, itself well. Um, so this is an example from, from this paper. Uh, is this an event? So how do I best know that this is an event? Like which explanation is best suited to help a human understand that this uh, indeed might be an event? Um, so basically, I think this is there's, there's not that much work on that um, currently, but um, training AI systems so that they articulate uncertainty, maybe ask questions back, and our great teachers uh, help us understand their reasoning. Um, in quotation marks, and we deployed a little bit of that. Um, this is um, a, a kind of mask, a, a test deployment, and here I'm asking, based on a knowledge base, the question, what's the former capital of Germany? And then the answer is, uh, there's contradicting answers, either Bonn or Berlin. Um, just a simple example. All right, um, so is it just patterns all the way down? So is it basically just more patterns and complex patterns and deeper patterns, and then we need to add a signal that maybe um, contains more reasoning, um, or is there something else? Um, and um, yeah, the the idea here is that depth may be just a function of degree and not kind. So maybe it's just more of the same, better signals, maybe more efficient training algorithms. And what I really liked is, is uh, this work, Otello GPT, um, it, it is basically trained on um, valid moves in the game of Otello. Um, that's basically everything that's trained on. So it never sees the board state. It basically is just looking at a sequence of valid moves, not even winning moves or good moves, just valid moves. And um, what has been found is that this leads to an internal representation inside the model that perfectly um, maps the board state. So it c the, the model learns to kind of build an internal board representation because that is useful. This is what's necessary to, uh, to know what are some valid moves. So just because the signal is there, the signal is clearly there in order to know what are valid moves. I need to know the board state. So the model kind of learns this implicitly. And this is further proven by uh, modifying this board state and basically t t uh, tinkering with that and um, then seeing the uh, impact in the model output. So it can basically go inside the brain of the model, modify the learned board state as if it were something different, and then the output of the model would change. So what I, like, what I like about this work is this is uh, in a very, very simple context showing that just the observations um, caused by a certain world can be enough to understand, to build a full representation of that world without ever interacting with it directly and without ever seeing it, including uh, what if. Um, dependencies. And um, you may have seen this. Um, this paper is asking, is neural, are neural networks smarter than second graders? And uh, doing this by uh, some sort of uh, questions, like challenge questions, like uh, this one, the sticks are placed on top of one another. Stick one and five are bottom and top. Which stick is in the middle? And then solve multiple choice questions. Um, and this is where current models are pretty bad at. It's like about 30%. Um, success rate and second graders are at around 80 percent um, success rate um, so how how does that relate with with human learning can we basically further um, improve that and um, I think when we look at grokking and when we look at human learning uh, it's maybe also interesting to remember that human learning is more or less a steady process so there's no uh, you can you can reasonably well predict the speed someone needs to learn something if you know their intelligence or their discipline right so um, look, going back from my own experience at university I kind of knew what I was in for how much time uh, would have to spend um, and so just briefly this is grokking work this is relatively old work but I think it's still interesting where um, by training for a long time, the model learned not only the representation, the superficial representation, but also the foundational um, um, mathematical rule that has caused this, this work. Um, all right. Um, 
So can we ma master uh, these, these uh, deeper, uh, deeper substantial structures? Um, and uh, there's a chain of thought prompting that you probably all know is like asking let's let things step by step. This is already um, using some sort of um, hacked loop uh, using the autoregressive transformer as some sort of loop structure that can refer back to earlier knowledge. And when we look at um, brains, this is like a very small insect brain. But when you lo we look at brains, it's interesting that um, in this brain, a lot of the signals actually travel, don't travel for a long time. So here, see, most of the signals actually don't go for longer than five hops. Um, so it's very, very shallow in a way, the signal input to output, but the structure is very complex, a lot of residuals and a lot of loops, like control for a structure. And this is one of the things that we're working on where I believe um, further breakthroughs are possible. Um, if we had a more modular system, a control flow kind of um, um, program running on top of them, we could be very more, a lot more efficient in, in data need and in inferencing need. And then, of course, we need interaction. So we need a way for systems to um, play around and, and uh, experience persistence. And, uh, of course, we also have some biologically hard-coded things that uh, make us do these, like humor or playful uh, tendencies. Um, which we could think about how to uh, hand them over to AI systems. All right, thanks. <laughs>